welcome back to the Village Bonfire for another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. A podcast not just for your mind, but for your body and spirit too. Here we don't just talk theory. Instead, we compassionately engage with our lived experiences and a wide variety of topics together, all to invite the question, in these times we find ourselves in, how do we be more human? Thank you for being here. May these conversations awaken, inspire, repair, and evolve something deep within each of us and serve the wild, tender aliveness of our personal and collective hearts. So welcome back to another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. As always, we begin with lighting our candle, invoking our village fire. Taking a few deep breaths together as we gather around it. And perhaps noticing as you take those breaths, like the feeling of the breath, the sensation of the breath, taking one area of your body to feel your breath in. But if your mind has been busy looping through stories or jumping back and forth between the future and the past, you just let yourself come here and now. Into your body. into the location on this planet where you are in this moment with sounds or smells or sights or textures. There, bringing all of you as you are today to the fire. Doing so with gratitude. for the ones who've come before, for the land, for the fire itself, for the old ways of gathering, to connect, to share stories, to share wisdom, to be together. And so we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, welcome to the fire, friends. <laughs> so today's guest is Hannah Lay. And I first met Hannah actually through a women's entrepreneurial group. And we just kind of connected and then um, have been sort of connecting more deeply over the last year and a half or so um, around sort of our a common passion of ours of sort of these remembering of old ways of being and relating to ourselves, to each other, to the land, to culture, and particularly through then the roots of our an European ancestral lineages and the songs and stories and culture bearers there. And so um, Hannah had started this Songs of Mother Europe, and I took the first round and then have supported a couple rounds. And so, yeah, so we've just been deepening this journey together um, in many ways, and it's been really beautiful. So I'm really excited to, yeah, to have her here today. Um, so I'll read you her bio. So Hannah Lay is a ceremonial musician, voice doula, weaver, visionary, and founder of a budding organization called Weaving Remembrance. 
She finds inspiration in remembering and supporting others to remember how to walk on this earth in deeper connection to self, community, ancestry, and land. The past several years have led her deeper into reclaiming European ancestral wisdom, most recently spending six months in England and Scotland, exploring stories, songs, and weaving traditions. She is the creatress of the online course Songs of Mother Europe, which features culture bearers from throughout Europe who are keepers of the old songs and ways of singing. She also co-facilitates wild song retreats and workshops throughout the States and Europe, as well as organizing ancestral pilgrimage, all focused on reconnecting us with our inherent wildness and belonging. So welcome, Hannah. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so I love to start each episode with, um, yeah, like in cultures around the world beyond sort of, it's always sort of been an old way to introduce ourselves in kind of more of the social fabric way of things rather than just like what we do, like who we are, where have we come from, <laughs> what forces have like shaped us, you know? And so, yeah, so I love to start the episode with just an invitation for you to introduce yourself in, um, yeah, in any way that feels, um, that feels resonant or present right now. What would you like people to know about the forces that shaped you? <laughs> Growing up in California, near Mexico, was one of the, I, when you asked that, one of the forces that has shaped me. I feel my high school was really diverse. White was not the majority. We had all colors of the rainbow, and my friend group was really diverse. And so I grew up with a sense of diversity. And my family, we would, my dad was a pastor in the church. We would go down to Mexico. And from a young age, I wanted to learn Spanish and just felt this cultural weaving mm. since a really young age so and ended up majoring in Spanish in college and living in Peru for a couple years and yeah and this kind of this this weaving that I feel like I've always been doing going into a new place and learning the ways almost married a Peruvian glad I didn't marry that particular person but like just going somewhere and really immersing myself and getting to know a whole different way of being and then and then traveling again and doing the same thing in another place so being adaptable and yeah seeing the diversity of the the human experience I feel like I've been blessed to see the a real really the extremes of like the poorest poor and the richest rich and just mm. have that in my consciousness that that exists and that every human has a heart mm. <laughs> all the way along the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The unifying aspect. Yeah. yeah. We all have joys and we all have suffering. Okay. Mm. Yeah. As you're sort of sharing that about, yeah, traveling and kind of really just immersing yourself. It's like, um, I mean, I know, like I just had such an image of like culture is, as water, you know, and we talk about that sometimes like culture being like the water that we swim in, you know? And it's like, here you are just like immersing yourself in the water of culture and the vibration of culture, taking that in and like letting that shape you. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just had like a really beautiful image come to me as you were kind of saying, saying that. And so I guess, yeah, we're, you know, because I know you a little bit and I know sort of that, that music is such a part of your offering and song and sound and vibration and then water too. So I guess, yeah, where, where did those threads kind of start to weave in or yeah. How does... Like tracking them back kind of. Sure. Or what do they mean for you now? Or yeah. Or I don't know. Music and like... water. They've probably always been there, <laughs> but <laughs> where did I even start with that? Um, music's been with me since a kid singing in church, growing up mm. in the Christian church, and which around 20, a part of my story is my life changing experience at 21 was the first time that I smoked cannabis mm. and just like changed my whole perception on reality just from that one night. Mm. And I had been told not to work with that plant because, you know, it was a drug and I had such a deep spiritual experience that I couldn't go back to calling myself a Christian after that. 
Mm -hmm. So that was, that really opened up. But the thread that was before that moment of growing up in the church and singing this devotion to God and Jesus was like always this place. I have these images in my mind of basically dissolving into the songs, just like really meeting that essence that meeting God and meeting the essence of Jesus through the songs it was like the Mm -hmm. songs that carried me there the songs that I could travel journey with and that would open my heart into this place of praise and worship and ecstasy in a way Mm -hmm. I have memories of that in church um but then after 21 since I wasn't um going to continue forth in that same tradition clearly then my musical path has Flow, flowed in all kinds of directions and had a time with um, when I was training to be a kundalini yoga teacher and working with the Gurmukhi chants and Sanskrit and then that time living in South America those years in Peru and starting to work with ayahuasca and the plant medicines and learning medicine songs and that devotion to the earth so the devotional thread with song has been something that's been there since early childhood Mm -hmm. and something that I continue to tend to and you asked about water so I feel like water is an easy one to be able to access that devotion with if I sit and be present with the mind-boggling I'm not a scientist, so maybe it's mind-boggling to me. Mm -hmm. H2O. Maybe Mm -hmm. H2O is mind-boggling. It's very scientific and matter of fact. But that's not how I experience water. I experience it as very magical and mystical and wow. Like Mm -hmm. brings me to tears, you know. It's like this being that just gives of itself unconditionally and quenches the thirst of so many beings Mm -hmm. (laughs) such a generous being so Mm -hmm. it's easy it feels easy to sing to that and it also feels helpful to sing to that being in a human body where I can often carry stress I'll say in the past in the past I've often carried stress (laughs) (laughs) five minutes ago five minutes ago yeah (laughs) we're talking it's it's moving it's opening up the emergent Uh, past (laughs) needing that fluidity Mm. needing that and being able to sing qualities of water this is I hold a small group program called birthing your wild voice and this is something we've been one of the themes I love to bring into this small group of women is water and voice like I always make time at least one if not two or three of our calls to go into water and the voice and yeah what I love is that actually there's a song coming through now that I would like Mm. that I would like to share with you as an example of what I mean yeah um and then this will all weave together I'm sure okay particular conversation yeah this oh yeah yeah, do you need to fix your sound Mm -hmm. there we go so this water song came to me a couple years ago I I had participated in a ceremony with some friends in Oregon and we were leaving the land where the ceremony took place and we were driving along this river and I was hearing this song in my head it was just like like these voices this happens sometimes in the way I receive songs is that I'll hear voices and then I just start to sing along with them like join the chorus of what they're already singing so this is one of those it's like oh hearing this song and I, I could have just let it go by, but in that moment, I was like, shh, can everybody be quiet? There's a song. I need to sing this song. Like, stop the chit-chat in the car, you know? And so everyone was like, oh, okay. So we got to go quiet, and this melody started coming through that I really love, and feels like, yeah, that image of the car going along the, wa- the, the windy road along the river. Mm. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but I'll give you a taste of the, the flavor of it. Mm. My the 
this verse that I like, these words that I like to embody with this song is, Still lake, flowing river, oh my own, your falling rain, ah, hey, um, ah, ah, hey, your falling rain, ah, hey, um, ah. still lake, flowing river, oh my own, your falling rain, ah, hey, um, ah, ah, hey, <laughs> falling rain, ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> the feeling quality, as much as I can give my being to that and be like, oh, what is this still lake? And I feel like all my energy is settled, even for a split second, be like, still lake. <sighs> Flowing river, wah! <laughs> <laughs> Falling rain. Falling rain. So, yeah, I like to experiment with bringing different qualities through my voice and that's a fun way to, to that song is yeah fun to sing those qualities with the water beautiful yeah thank you and actually if you don't mind switching your sound now mm -hmm. just it's, it optimizes your voice yeah <laughs> beautiful thanks uh, or your speaking voice I should say we know it doesn't always optimize singing voices <laughs> thanks zoom <laughs> Yeah. Mm. I love, um, yeah. I mean, I, f I feel that so much, you know, it's interesting. I had, um, Shannon on a couple episodes ago and, you know, and she was talking about to really channel, like so much of what we need is like safety in our body. And, and I think there's a piece of that. And I also think, um, there's like a, a surrender too, actually. And I mean, maybe we need the safety first, but I feel like we can't rest at the safety because so much of what you're describing, both in just kind of how you love to weave with culture and just like throw yourself into a culture and just like, I mean, it is like, and even just now when you're, were as I was just like feeling into and, and witnessing and experiencing you kind of bringing that song through, you know, it's like, like, yeah, there's a certain element of us-ness that sort of has to dissolve in order to really be able to become that hollow bone or that, you know, what that hollow vessel, whatever they call that, to be able to really channel something through. And so there's, you know, we have to have a certain sense of like belonging or like trust or anchoring in some way that will help us come back again but it's like, then it's like, yeah, there's a certain amount of like throwing ourselves into it and being willing to like disappear as we know ourselves, like as our brain knows ourselves so that we can, yeah, become malleable so that like the sound shapes us or the culture shapes us or the whatever like shapes us. We become like the clay that gets shape to become whatever instrument or to become whatever vessel. I don't know. That's like what's coming to me. Does that stir anything for you? Yes. Yesterday, actually, I pulled out this, um, do you know, this Kundalini chant, Om Namo Gurudev Namo, like bowing to the teacher within, bowing to mm -hmm. the real wisdom. I've loved that mantra. It's been one, it's one of the, yeah, non-English mantras that I really love. And it's just ca carried with me through the years. And I visited it, visited it yesterday with some friends in a group. And I remembered that my teacher of mantra, Prabhu Namkar, shout out, who's Namkar's mom, who raised Namkar in the, in the, singing mantra tradition she talked about the mantras as being these boats that carry us to a different state of consciousness so I feel like that was somewhat similar to what you're saying or like you know we get I I get on this boat and then I get this combination of sounds and ways that my mouth is moving and codes that are in the sound open up a whole other way of being in my consciousness mm. 
go there and yeah, in a way not be myself anymore, just mm -hmm. dissolve into that river. Mm -hmm. And hopefully be changed and remember more of my expanded, my greater sense of self through mm -hmm. that and Hanale and her stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although she's lovely and her stories are, you know, I'm everything's sure. so important. Her life is just so important and her problem is <laughs> very important and her is very important. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, so what is that like? I mean, where is that balance, right? For you anyway, because I think that that's something we grapple with on sort of these spiritual paths, like as human beings having spiritual or spiritual beings having human experiences or whatever, you know, however you want to call it, right? Like, like we're seeking this expanded state of consciousness. Yes, but like not at the you know, not, not at the cost of like, we incarnated in human bodies for a reason, right? Like, like humanity exists for some reason. And so it's not like in my mind anyway, it's not like this is less than, you know, but it's like, it's that weaving together maybe. And so, yeah, what is that balance like for you? Kind of that pursuing the expanded state of consciousness, but also like being Hanalei. And like, <laughs> I think that having a business the last couple of years or before that, before I had a business, having a garden, mm. like having these things that keep me. Mm. We are frozen. Yes. Okay. I think we're back. <laughs> Although I don't seem to have sound for you right now. And you have sound for me now? Yes. Cool. I was saying so, yeah, that you were saying business and garden. Mm -hmm. Which, yes, my business these last couple of years has been my garden. I haven't had as much of a physical garden that I'm tending that I have in other times in my life been a farmer and a gardener and having something to show up to with consistency is so healthy. I think of the parents too, doing that work every day. They can't transcend and leave the earth because people are dependent on them. Little, mm -hmm. little people are depending on them. Mm. I find more and more the last handful of years where I just want to be more human, which I love that that's a, a theme of what, what you're bringing through in this podcast. I'm like, wow, what is it to be of of earth like I've definitely spent mm. a lot of time with the plant medicines out in all the realms and they're mm. really making you know the astral and whoa and the and like yeah how do I bring these things through um so I think the balance for me looks like actually keeping my space clean I didn't used to do that like it has mm. taken me till my 30s to like really keep my space clean and that's one of my places where I find balance like oh yes mm. clean like that really helps me with a sense of balance in the physical realm mm. and having time and having intentional time to journey to whether that's working with plant medicines or there's an amazing woman that I work with who does dream work. So mm. I really intentionally work with my dreams and ask them to come through in the mornings. And if there's one that comes through, I'm like, whoa, that was a potent dream. Then I'll take it to this woman, Carla Rafojo, mm -hmm. <laughs> like shout out and do the dream work. But having these, I'll often yeah, work with different people who hold certain modalities to basically hold a space for myself so that I can journey. So it helps me to have another person there. But if it, if I don't, then I'm just at my altar. Maybe I'll be drumming or or yeah, going and journeying out in nature without needing to be back at a certain time. So I get into that dream. Like it's like really important for me to find intentional times to go into the dream, mm -hmm. dream, like states of consciousness, whether that's yeah, just through a hike in nature, or drumming, plant medicines, different kinds mm -hmm. of sessions. And then how can I take that information? And like, that's where it gets fun actually is, mm -hmm. oh, and then what's the action that I can take? That's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I think we're lost you there again for a moment. Okay, back on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, so you're saying the action that it would take that would bring you, like, yeah, what's the action that would bring the dream space or the journey space or the expanded consciousness 
like and Aiden. weave it into this reality. That's so cool to me. We get these insights, and then we have these body vehicles where we get to actually bring the visions into 3D. It's so magical. And the, one example is a Scotland pilgrimage. I did a Scotland pilgrimage last fall, co-facilitated with a woman named Lana, who Kate knows, who's a really dear sister now. I met her in the Songs of Mother Europe online that I created last year. She, she joined as a participant and I knew she was in Scotland and I had had a dream for five years. I had received the vision through an ayahuasca ceremony and then proving Amazon to go to mm -hmm. Scotland. That was the message that came really clear. It felt like it was an ancestral calling here. I'm like down in the Amazon working with a whole other tradition of ancestral mm -hmm. wisdom. I'm being called to go towards my own ancestry in that time over five years, about five years for that vision to ripen. But it was seeded in me in one of those uh, altered states of consciousness, which again, doesn't need to come through plant medicines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and through so many ways, through prayer, through meditation. And, and then I was like, okay, this is the time. And it came through, it mm -hmm. came into like, just having that experience of, yeah, receiving information from the other realms and then bringing it into the physical and then creating this whole beautiful ancestral pilgrimage to Scotland with nine of us women last mm -hmm. autumn that was really blessed and I felt very guided. Mm -hmm. It's like that, that to me is fun. I want to keep doing that, like keep responding to what I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. like, and that's like the integration and also the responsibility of me growing growing into my groundedness on the earth and mm -hmm. it's okay I make all these prayers I ask for guidance and then like little things come through and some and I don't always follow the little things maybe sometimes I'm waiting for a big thing but like mm -hmm. oh don't eat this or like you know, it can come in smaller ways or like reach out to you have to call this person write this person a note like all those little intuitive guidances that, that come as part of how we're weaving um, the balance of human and mm -hmm. other wisdom. So I was riffing on that. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love to, I mean, that piece about, you know, I think so often in our culture, we're not very good at valuing that intuitive time. Right. And that like intentional journeying time that you're talking about, you know, to like sit down and develop those skills and like build that relationship and practice that. And that, you know, it's like that, that we're so busy surviving as humans that we don't make time for that. And again, I, like I'm saying, that's a cultural thing. I'm not putting the onus for that on like any one person. <laughs> that's, that's the stuff that we can't just like hashtag self-care our way out of, right? It's like, and yeah, but it, that fuels the stuff that we do, you know, it, or it can, if we let it rather than just like running, 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 you know, it's, or escaping or, you know, whatever the other, you know, I feel like a lot of the ways that we fall into working with that stuff. Um, I want to keep learning what that is to receive, like we could call it if we want to do the binary thing, the feminine, my, my feminine receiving this, the wisdom that's coming from the earth, the womb, which is so connected to, to bearing life and thriving life and receiving that guidance. And then my action part or my masculine part bringing, then, then listening and responding and doing the thing, like mm -hmm. just like keep tending to that balance in my life so that my actions aren't are actually guided by a deeper wisdom not just mm -hmm. like action for the sake of productivity and getting ahead and blah 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 but I'm not spending so much time in the dreamy that nothing ever really gets accomplished you know mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah have you do you feel like that's always been something that's called to you or do you feel like that's something newer on your journey or do you feel like that's a practice. Yeah. Like, what is that? What is that? What is your journey of like realizing that integration for lack of a better word is kind of like the thing, you know, I mean, you mentioned that you spent a lot of time kind of in those seeking out those expanded states. And so as you, 
you know, and now it's more about wanting to get better, continue to be in that dance of like bringing it in and doing the things, you know, but like anchored through that deeper wisdom. And so what kind of has that trajectory been like, because I feel like that's a piece that's really missing a lot in culture and that a lot of us kind of struggle with. It's like you have the vision, but then you're trying to live it or it, I I don't know. It like, yeah, like it doesn't always quite link up, you know, what is that? I think getting to places, actually the things that came to me when you're saying that is several years ago, getting to a place with money where I didn't have any money and was really struggling and felt like I couldn't bring through what I wanted to bring through because I didn't have the money for it. Like that was very sobering Mm -hmm. (laughs) to be like, okay, this is a thing. Learn how to be in relation with it. How do you want to channel it? This is a part of this particular story that's happening on earth right now, whether it will continue and, and I hope that it shifts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have an elder out here in Maui who's very like holding the vision for the money system to, I mean, we're also living in a place where everybody's growing food and mm-hmm. there's a lot of sustainable, but there's a lot of resource out there in that mm-hmm. way. So our friends in the city wouldn't be so well off as we are out here if that mm-hmm. happened, but like, yeah, holding the vision for money to disappear and that whole system to crumble. And I think that that was, that has been a part of my integration these last years is, I mean, and my grounding of, okay, mm-hmm. I want to be able to live in this world in a good way. Mm. I want to be able to bring through the visions that are calling to my heart. And so I need to learn these skills Mm -hmm. and I still am learning these skills. Mm -hmm. I want to work with this energy of money. And so money has been one inspiration in, in the bringing, bringing it down. And then also the nervous system, I would say like needing to learn ways of slowness it's like grounding. Literally, just had I, for a lot of years, I struggled with so much anxiety mm. and dysregulation, and mm. I'm still journeying with it. Mm. How in, in curious about it and wait places that it shows up in my life or throughout the day if I'm disassociating or anxious, and I I feel like it's smoothed out because I'm yeah making my home and. I need my cat having my rituals that feel like hmm, <sighs> makes my mm. human animal body feel safe. Okay, mm. got money, got food, got got a candle. Okay, great. Okay, we're doing all right. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love too what what you're kind of one of the threads I was noticing and what you were just sharing is yeah that part about ritual as being sort of a force for regulation and, and grounding and, and um yeah are you open to teasing that thread out a little bit more like what because I think that's some of in the ancestral rememberings piece right like I mean I think that's one of the things that culturally we've lost you know um in the modern world, right? If we're kind of looking at what our like modern quote unquote ills are like the, the disease of modernity. Right. (laughs) And like, you know, for me anyway, because I've, I've had sort of somebody ask me that question before. Like if you, what, like, why are you looking back? Like, it's not like there was some magical time when everything was perfect, you know, and like, we should only look forward, you know, and, and Yeah. But, you know, and so there's so much wisdom behind us. And so I think for me, some of that is in the ritual and in the ways that we had more woven into our culture that were automatically more regulating and like grounding and like kept us in this human space a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know, for me, that's some of why, like, I want to look back because it's like, when I look back, I find those practices and then I can bring them forward or I can find what feels right in these days and times in my body. But it like, yeah, I don't know. So that's sort of for me, but I don't know for, yeah, for you, what is, why, why do you look back? I guess. (laughs) 
I get, I have this like image when you're saying looking back, it's almost like I'm actually some part of me is like reaching back like this. Mm. And I can feel this thread of wisdom that lives in my body and it is coming from behind and it wants to keep going through. Yeah. Know that there are like, there's a substance of ways of living on the earth that have been forgotten that aren't yeah. being practiced. Like that's just intimacy with land and place such intimacy with place like it's something I've only tapped into like barely dipped into I'd say mostly here in Maui through the first five years I was here like farming and eating sometimes for months without even buying food and starting to get this even just like a hint of what it what it's like to live in intimacy with land Mm. so I look back because there's that sense I'm not even like look, looking back, but I'm open to like, I'm reaching back or like opening, letting mm-hmm. that pathway, like opening that aperture and being like, yes, stream mm-hmm. through, R- remind me of, of what I've forgotten. Remind me of the simplicity of plants. Remind me of the wisdom of plants. Remind me of the simplicity of how water heals, how song heals, mm-hmm. how kind words heal. Like it does feel like, does feel like there's a simplicity that I feel actually as I'm tuning into that of what maybe there's not these complex rituals that I need to remember from my European ancestry maybe it's more just maybe it's more silence maybe Mm. it's just like more awareness more paying attention to the subtleties of the shifts of nature and the how different birds are talking to each other just being more alive on the earth being more sensitized again Mm -hmm. to what's actually happening on the plant the living planet not just Mm -hmm. my stories and my screen Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's exciting (laughs) that why I look back is because when I've tasted these like earth Mm -hmm. like I was sharing that the first few years in Maui living pretty barefoot out here and growing food and not buying food. And it's like, it's so sensual and healthy and I feel wild again. And I feel connected. I feel like, yeah, I feel connected when I'm able to. So I feel like a lot of it for me is the reconnecting Instead of just living in my house and only driving my car to the grocery store and then coming back and being in my office like okay what's like mm-hmm. what's happening in the forest what's happening mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I was uh, yeah I was on a similar journey to that it's funny I actually didn't realize you'd majored in Spanish I majored in French <laughs> in college so look at us majoring in languages but yeah and then I got into farming um, shortly after graduating from college and yeah, it was so healing for me just like, you know, it's so easy for us to like live on the earth rather than as the earth or with the earth. And, Mm. and you don't even know that there's a difference until you've like felt it in your body. You know, mm-hmm. like, like even drawing that, that distinction linguistically, like, uh, like it doesn't like until you've, for me anyway, yeah. Until I like felt it in my body, I didn't even really know that I wasn't living. Like, I didn't know that that level of connection was possible, you know? And then, yeah, it was like, I was eating food. I was growing and I was working outside and I was moving my body. And it wasn't so much about like the thoughts I was thinking, but it was more about like, I mean that, you know, it's helpful to have a brain and have it help you with problem solving, which is like, you need a lot of problem solving when you're farming, but you know, it's like, but it was like the brain became the tool rather than this like deity that we we like bow to, which is kind of what academia is in a lot of ways in our, just our post enlightenment um, culture is very head devoted. And so it was like devoting to something else. And, um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I totally, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, or I'm, I'm hearing similar resonance in what you're sharing, you know, of this, like, to just, yeah, to feel yourself as belonging. And I think maybe that's, you know, it's interesting. I had a conversation recently with somebody where I was sort of getting curious, like, do we need safety or do we need belonging? And I think we often think we need safety when actually what we're missing is belonging and, and not just like belonging to other humans, but belonging to this like larger web and, and to, to feel like we're here and to feel like there is this thread of wisdom, you know, yeah, there's wounds and yeah, there's like, like shit that got messy, like with our ancestors, right. But like, there's also like this thread of wisdom that's available for us to, like you said, open that portal, open that aperture and like, let it somehow come through. And it's been interesting too, even, you know, recently I started kind of getting, grasping this idea of mythical ancestors. And I think that's particularly been coming through for me in, um, actually working some more with the Irish traditions because, you know, they have such a sense of like the Tua de Danan, like your mythical ancestors who like are, you know, for them, it's not a lot of times what I've encountered in sort of these more spiritual and story-based practices is like, we have these gods and goddesses and consciousnesses. And it's like, we have to go on these journeys to meet them. And yes, they share wisdom with us, but then you know, there, many of them were not really human, right. And didn't really have this sense of like what it is to be in this earth. And so sometimes it feels really challenging for me to like bring their wisdom through or, you know, find ways to like make it relevant in this human body and with the constraints of physics and (laughs) material things and having a body that needs money and shelter and like all of these other things. Right. And it's been so fascinating because since working more with the practice, the Irish practice of Imbus and, you know, um, yeah, the Tua de Danan and like all of that stuff, it's like the consciousnesses that they're not like, you know, astral consciousnesses that are somewhere out there. They're mythical ancestors who lived and walked on the earth and then went into the earth and now store the ancestral wisdom in the earth. And Mm -hmm. it's, so something clicked for me and it was interesting in the last like couple of weeks as I've been working with clients and like working with myself, I've, you know, when I open sacred space, I don't just invite in my well ancestors and my guides and consciousnesses, you know, I also have been inviting in like mythical ancestors and it's been fascinating. It's like, I've started seeing all these new things like with more clarity in clients fields and I'll have these mythical ancestors actually like come up and start working on the client, like the client, you know, I welcome in a client's mythical ancestor, for example, and like they'll come through and actually start like touching. I can see the, the mythical ancestor, like touching the person's body or like blowing into the body or like, you know, working with the client's body and and they are like, they are, they're more connected with that earth resonance. And, um, and so there's something about it that's different. And so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I feel like I've taken us on this like whole tangent here, but, but it like to kind of bring it back, it's like, A, we don't know what we don't know until we can somehow name it in some way, which is part of where I think some of that looking back also helps because it just helps us start to like put a name to the things we're experiencing and be like, oh, this isn't just my imagination. This might actually be a valid thing. And then you get to create your own relationship with it. But I mean, so I think there's like that piece of things, but then, you know, there's just so many different layers or like access points too. And so, you know, I mean, one of the downsides and benefits I feel like to today's culture is we can, we have access to so many different cultures and like spiritual ancestry, you know, and, and there's, you know, there's plenty of problematic, (laughs) not super great reasons for that. So I name that and I honor that. And, you know, we're not going to go back to a time where 
white people don't know about yoga, you know, <laughs> or where like, you know, um, non Peruvian, you know, non Amazonian jungle people like don't know about the plant medicines that are there, you know, and uh, like, so, you know, we're not going to go back to a world where we don't have this cross pollination and like cross pollination has always been a thing. Um, but yeah, but it feels like somehow there's something to like, yeah, like opening that aperture and like letting the wisdom come through that just, I don't know, illuminates different layers of things or invites us into deeper ways of knowing hmm. and gives us different names or language or, I mean, in the same way you were talking about going to another country, you know, I mean, I feel like going to quote unquote, the past is sort of like going to another country. And like, it doesn't mean that we're meant to like take everything we find there or that everything is perfect there or whatever, but it's like, can we open ourselves to something and let it change us, you know, and see what then new things we can create in the future. I don't know. That's my like, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, there's been a thread that's been with me since college. So like 20, probably age 20, where I had this desire to live with the tribe. Mm -hmm. I ended up going to Peru finally when I was 25 or 26, but it, the seed was in me for a lot earlier that I wanted to go and live with a tribe that didn't have anything machine made. Like, what would it be like to live in a village with nothing machine made? Do people really just make everything by hand and eat and mm -hmm. live and I still feel that craving in me for that reference point mm. of that it's possible to live on the earth without mm. like life existed before industrialization mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I went to the Scottish Cranog Center last when we were in Scotland the Scottish Cranog Center is well, I'll just use the Scottish Cranog Center as basically how cool would it be to just go into a Neolithic or even Paleolithic, just spend a day in the life, you know, a day in the life. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Cranog Center actually has like a day where you can go, it's like a day in the life and you do different crafts. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's been some some craving in my being and I, for that. And I've had a vision for land for many years and mm -hmm. I feel that something that is ripening in that vision is to have an ancestral house of some kind so depending on what land that is like having a building that is the old mm -hmm. however however old you can go back like mm -hmm. there's several in wales there's several traditional roundhouses that are mm -hmm. like neo neolithic style roundhouses um i'm not sure how this is all weaving into you were saying but just like I've become obsessed with this like image of a roundhouse, like mm -hmm. the thatch and the stone, mm -hmm. the fire in the center. And it's such a universal image too. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I looked yesterday, I was like, I want to know more about the Kogi people, you know, these amazing indigenous tribe in Colombia that are in the heart of the world in Colombia. And I started to watch a documentary yesterday and see that they're all in roundhouses, like mm -hmm. that look very similar to the roundhouses of the Celtic Isles. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, oh, something just where life felt, feels real. And mm. I guess I do romanticize the past, um, admittedly. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, but I mean, but I think, you know, some of what you're pointing to there is, I mean, yes, there was like a lot about the past, the realness of some of those times that was like really brutal and life expectancy was really short and whatever, right? But like, but it also, I mean, there is, I think there's, we're going, I feel like in today's, we're going so deep into like AI world, right? And like art is AI and writing is AI and music is AI and money is crypto. And, you know, like all of these things that are just moving us further and further away, actually, like moving what we think of as reality as like further and further away from things we can actually touch, things we can actually make with our hands, things that engage our bodies, not just like our brains, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think there, 
is like, I, you know, again, we're not going to be in, we're never going to be in a world that doesn't have AI at this point. Like, that's just not realistic. The technology has been created and here we are, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's not inherently bad. Right. But just like with anything, it's like, how do we approach it? And so here's that, I think that balance question again, of like, you know, do we spend all our time in expanded states of consciousness or do we be human? Do we spend all our time in AI or like in our brains, or do we like also remember how to like make things with our hands and like move our body through space and time and like touch things. And, um, what does the both look like? Yeah, exactly. Or but I noticed I was doing an either or in these last couple of months. It's like, yeah, yeah fuck that. Like, no, I'm going to keep, I'm going to go make my roundhouse and go deeper into the earth, you know? And then I have this really awesome sister in California. She's like, oh, I'm stoked about AI. And I really respect her. And I feel like she's an amazing medicine woman. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's just like, it was a good moment. I was like, I realized that I had been making this polarization mm -hmm. in my own being. And I was like, oh yeah. Why is it a problem? Yeah. I feel like we're here to bridge worlds. That's what's happening. Yeah. And, I get, and how do we stay in our discernment throughout it? Like, I feel like our hearts do have the discernment. So we don't need to like, be like no, that's totally bad. Or like, because I've definitely done that a lot in this life of like, I'm going to go deeper into the nature and like drop out. Like for, there was a while where mm -hmm. I wanted to just drop out be like fuck this society like I want to just grow my food and never like just live in a village without electricity and cook mm. by fire and I still actually like I want to keep going in that direction like mm -hmm. I want to have a place but how I see it more is a place on the land that anchors that and then there's like yeah there's like the roundhouse and then there's also like the recording studio and mm -hmm. <laughs> like a balance weaving mm -hmm. the world yeah yeah I think that's such a throat chakra thing, right? Like, uh, you know, that, that sound is one of the first ways we have of making what's truly subtle material, you know, like our voice is the first instrument, that first gateway, that's something that is like just potential energy like passes through to become something that can be transmitted or like heard by other people, you know, something like comes through in the world. So I feel like, you know, it's funny through this conversation, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're such a like, yeah, it's just such a like throat chakra, <laughs> like so much of like who you are in your like deepest essence is like, like, yes, heart, but also like throat chakra. I don't know. It's like this whole thing. Yeah. So many of the threads that you've shared about your journey and your story and the things that like really light you up and like, oh, like, yeah, there it is. Like right there. It's that question of like taking potential like, energy and like bringing it earth side in some way. And it's like, whether it's voice or whether it's through your hands or you've worked as a birth doula too, right at times. So like, that's another way of potential energy. Like, you know, that, the tending those portals where potential energy becomes material, you know, where we take something that's only potential and turn it into something that, um, you know, is still ephemeral, but you know, is, is somehow like more tangible or more fixed or more, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to share about excitement about indigenous languages mm. other words, and I've, I've, for years since college, I had this fascination with actually back then it was like people who would go and translate ugh, it gives me a little cringe but like go and translate the bible they would go to like tribes and try mm. to find like the forgotten languages and translate the bible in their language and I was hearing stories about that clash of and I was so fascinated by that and I was like do I want to do that go like be a bible translator but mostly I just wanted to go like live with the people and learn language you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so when like the Christianity identity dissolved it's I, that prayer stayed with me like I want to learn and prepare to learn an indigenous language and 
And mm. I didn't know which one because it's quite a commitment. <laughs> and I was like, maybe it's Quechua because I love Peru. It feels so, such a beautiful language, Quechua. And then it just ripened four months ago. I'm on my day, 128 day streak in the Duolingo app. I've been learning Scottish Gaelic and Hawaiian at the same time because my brain really likes languages. And yeah, I studied in actually Spanish and French in college, romance mm -hmm. language, and, mm -hmm. and learned a little Swahili and German. So I've been, I, I mm -hmm. wouldn't call myself like multilingual. I would say Spanish is the only one I speak fluently. There's also a wood chipper happening behind if you hear that sound. Okay, <laughs> it's not too bad. No. <laughs> Doing things out on the land. Um, I just get, I get so excited. I remember braiding sweetgrass. She has this whole part mm -hmm. of the book around indigenous languages too, and mm -hmm. just how their whole getting into an indigenous language is such a shift of our consciousness. And that, mm -hmm. that was what I've been craving of like, can I immerse myself again, that like cultural weaving, can I immerse myself in a language so that I see the world totally different and mm -hmm. things start to come alive that my English brain wasn't even aware of because it didn't have like things were just kind of too locked down into square shapes but there's a whole yeah it's just mm. so cool and I think song is that too it can get between the cracks of like the English language and open up pathways of awareness and aliveness to our sounding and so I'm very excited about the, the path of continuing to learn Scottish game <laughs> I'm curious mm. I'm four months in when I go back to Scotland this fall Lana and I are going to do a a pilgrimage again mm -hmm. I'm curious if I'll be able to read a couple words on the signs or you know and there's mm -hmm. not a population of people who actually speak Scottish Gaelic so yeah relatively but yeah yeah say hello goodbye I could definitely do that I got the hello and goodbye awesome <laughs> yeah yeah it's um it is. I mean, I feel like so much is stored in our languages and in our songs and in like, I feel like those are some of the ways we start to open that aperture as you were calling it earlier. So that like that ancestral wisdom can shine through because, you know, yeah, our brains are shaped in many ways by the language. And, um, I've talked about that chapter that you're talking about in braiding sweetgrass, you know, and how she was talking about, and I, I don't know if it's pronounced Potawatomi or, um, I don't know how it's pronounced, but anyway, in her, the language she is studying her indigenous language, first nations language that she was studying. Um, they were talking, she was talking about how it's 70% verbs and 30% nouns and English is 70% nouns and 30% verbs. And totally. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it does, it changes how you think about the world. It changes like how you perceive or understand the world to, to whether your language is predominantly verbs, which is like an emergent process, right? an action happening versus if your language is mostly nouns, which are things, which is more about possession or static state like fixed state um yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not a tree a tree there it's to be a tree mm -hmm. it's matter that is currently being a tree <laughs> <laughs> yeah so fun that's a, like that's more of what I want in my life like um like unlock um, loosening opening becoming more alive more free more connected mm -hmm. less bound by stories of my own culture mm -hmm. culture um, this woman Nala Walla who I've done she's up in Port Townsend Washington I I started with her doing ancestral work um several years ago and I just, and then I reconnected with her a couple of weeks ago for a session. It had been several years. And I realized that I've, that I'm weaving this piece too, that I've become a weaver in this, this last year. I'd say, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a weaver now. Like, okay, mm -hmm. like definitely a baby beginning, but yeah, I'm doing it. Like it's part of my life. I'm a weaver and I can feel like I'm going to continue on this pathway for the rest of my life. Like I'm very excited about being a weaver for the rest of my life and all the ways that it looks, baskets and textiles people and 
songs mm -hmm. um, but that information to be to do start weaving had come through the first session I had done with Nala and I had met a guide on my mother's mother's line which is who which is Scottish Scottish English and that the ritual homework that this grandmother gave me was to weave a willow basket and I mm -hmm. asked this guide is there something that I could do to show up to this healing of the lineage and she she gave me that and so a couple of weeks ago, I reconnect with Nala and I realize these three years have passed, maybe three or four since that first session and how much that work, the ancestral work is really informing my path, like mm. more than I even realize. It's like, wow, I've been going to Scotland and creating songs of Mother Europe and weaving baskets and it's so rich, like it feels really nourishing. Mm. Um, I think I originally brought up Nala's name because she calls it, we're not, she says we're not in a culture, we're in a dysbiosis. Mm. Oh, she's like you can tell there's a culture <laughs> oh that's interesting <laughs> oh this biosis what is that I don't even I don't know if I know what that uh, word means but I was like when I think of that word my belly goes like oh yeah it sounds very icky <laughs> like my gut is off yeah um so anyway are you looking it up? I'm Is looking it? it up. Yeah. Okay. Well, Give it a moment. Mine is a reduction of microbial diversity and a combination of loss of beneficial bacteria. Hmm. So basically imbalance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that's part of why, I mean, I like that idea of calling it culture because from an, from an energetic standpoint, you know, like, yes, we have, like, I think a lot of times when we hear that word, we think of like art or we think of story or movie, you know, right. We think of like maybe fashion, right. The sort of the trappings of culture. And what I love about that word too, though, is like that biological definition, you know? So it's like, we have like the Petri dish, the environment in which that determines how the cells are growing, right? Like that's its culture. And so like collections of cells and the environment in which they grow, right? So that question of like, what are the forces that shaped you, right? Like that's really a question of culture. And like, as an energy, like when I work on the level and I, I tap into the world on the level of energy, you know, it's like we have, like our energy fields are our Petri dish in a lot of ways. And so, and then the larger culture is also our Petri dish, right? And so it's like, and so we have these different layers where we can start to change culture, you know? And so if we don't like how things are growing, if we don't like what we're seeing in the world, then we have to start to like change the culture. And like, it's kind of a two-pronged thing where we have to do it internally. We have to change our inner culture so that our cells are growing in a different way, which allows us to create different things. But then we also have to like, and through that, then we change the outer culture. So it, you know, and it's not like a one first and then the other, it's kind of a both and at the same time, you know, but it's, um, yeah, you know, I think that, that piece of, yeah, like if we don't, and that, you know, I think that's part of why I started this podcast, you know, is I was like, like, what am I creating and how do we like bring through these conversations that, like I know I'm having with lots of different people, but how do we keep making this more public and keep like sharing this process so that we're, yeah, we're changing how our cells are growing. We're changing the forces that shape us into something that maybe feels more generative or that feels more reparative or that feels more, you know, whatever. Um, and then through that, then we're, you know, we're able to, it frees us up to create different things, but that's, you know, I think that's part of where that ancestral stuff for me comes in too, is it's like, that's part of how I change, like that allows me to tap into another layer of forces that are present in my personal Petri dish, you know? And so if I want to change the culture in my personal Petri dish so that my cells are growing differently, epigenetically, my DNA is getting triggered differently, you know, all of those things like how I show up in my relationships and in my world is different than like, I have to like, yeah, tapping into the ancestral remembrings piece 
you know, my ancestors are in this personal Petri dish with me, you know, vibrationally and in my body. And so like tuning into them through song, through story, through, you know, whatever. Um, and then, yeah, like asking them, what homework do you have for me? And, you know, it's like, I feel like my guides have been telling me I need to be doing more writing and more story work, like for a long time. And then recently I had, um, yeah, like a direct ancestor, I think, um, come through and yeah. And that's what he's here to help me do. Um, so yeah. So anyway, it, you know, and it does, it like, it does, it changes, it changes how we present in the world because it changes how we feel on the inside, you know, and then through that, then it's like, we, yeah, we're creating, we create different art, we create different systems, we create different whatever. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, that's part of why I love like thinking of it as culture, you know, and, and I love what she's pointing out too, though, that like, yeah, that, that what we have right now is, is imbalanced culture. <laughs> uh, we're being shaped by imbalance. So it can be defined as a reduction in micro microbial diversity. Mm -hmm. So basically monocrops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I have a whole rant. I go on sometimes about how like, that is what like white supremacist culture is, is like it's monoculture. Agriculture is white supremacist culture applied to the earth, <laughs> um, applied to how we grow food and look at the environment. That started 10,000 years ago. What? Agriculture. Right. Or 10 or 10 to 14,000 years ago or something. So you're saying that in, that is also no, monoculture, monoculture and agriculture. Monoculture is, is how race is showing up in the agricultural world. Because race is a much more, much newer construct. And so is the idea of growing one crop or trying to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. sameness. <laughs> and lack of diversity, which ultimately actually leads to lack of resiliency. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. So I feel like this feels like it might be a time to kind of land the plane a little here, start bringing that down and in. Does that feel true for you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is there anything else you feel called to share or speak into our fire, into our conversation, into this moment today. Um, I'd like to share the, the inspiration, the prayer for those listening around mm -hmm. the voice and singing with nature, like mm -hmm. to give ourselves how the, it just started pouring when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I feel a little. <laughs> yeah, to, the encouragement, the invitation to go when next time you're on your in on a nature walk where you feel safe to make sound is to experiment singing with the trees and the raindrops and the crackle of the leaves under your feet or whatever it is, just opening the voice, opening the heart, and in this childlike exploration way, I've really been feeling. That's a piece I've been working with my small group too. Containers like let's play. Mm. So much intelligence comes through play. So much connection and just remembering that childlike way of just opening the voice out in nature because it's fun. Nobody's judging and mm -hmm. it feels good. Ooh, all kinds of fun sounds come out. So mm. that's a yeah, hope that people's hearts can be happy singing out with the trees, the desert, wherever you find yourself on this earth. Yeah. And see what that conversation is too. Like yeah. There's a way of singing too, and then also a way of receiving through the sound. You can try try both ways, actually sing the song that's coming through or like sing out a prayer, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, that's relationship, that's conversation, right? We introduce ourselves and then we hear, and then we sing back, you know, and, and some of it's like sharing what we think. And some of it's asking questions or like, yeah, mirroring or yeah. Um, I feel like that sort of brings us a little bit full circle in some ways when you're talking about water and fluidity in the body, you know, I noticed for me, as I've been playing more with sounds and out on hikes or just in general, it's like, that's also been another way for me to find and, and actually working ancestrally because so much of what's gummed up in our bodies is actually ancestral stuff that's stored, like the icky stuff that's stored as well as the good stuff. And so, yeah, I don't know. It just, I feel like the more I like give voice to sound you know, it's like the more fluidity I find in my joints and the more fluidity I find in my body and the more full range of expression I find like in my voice, but then also in my face or in my experience. And it does, it's like, it happens. On, yeah. <laughs> Making faces. <laughs> yeah. It happens on like so many of these levels, you know, and it's, I mean, I think that's like, maybe that's some of what being more human is like before we even started recording, you know, and I sort of was framing up like, yeah, these conversations happen around kind of this, you know, what is it to be more human? And it's like, what if it's like more of a full range of expression? Like, definitely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I just did a road trip in California last week with this really sweet song sister, Katie. And we, there would be, we'd been on a four hour part of our journey and two hours of that would be us just singing back and forth to like sounding back and forth to each other. It's such a good psychic enema <laughs> to like mm. less thinking and more singing, like to really just, I feel like it just, my brain can't really hold on to things because I'm making sound and then <laughs> it's just like whew, such a good clearing even yeah setting your timer on your phone for 10 minutes being like I'm just gonna make sound or let my voice go play for 10 minutes mm -hmm. and then oh I got to a little edge I don't know what else to sing I'm gonna make a song about that and you mm -hmm. make sounds and then just like keep it flowing it's like oh mm -hmm. there's the water's flowing there's the like song channel starting to open mm -hmm. good Hmm. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. So how can people find you or if people want to connect or where, yeah, where are you in the online world? And is there anything happening in your business you want to share about right now? Yes. I'm, I'm really excited about my business. The name that has come through in this last even six months that is birthing out is or six to nine months is weaving remembrance. And Weaving Remembrance is a budding organization supporting people to connect with earth and ancestral wisdom. And I feel like this organization of Weaving Remembrance is going to keep guiding me, is, is the prayer that I'm serving. And so all that that means will continue to unfold. And right now, for this coming fall, it means another one of our online courses called Songs of Mother Europe, which features eight to 10 different song carriers from different places in Europe who carry old songs. And our, our my hope is to find the oldest songs in Europe or you get a <laughs> different, you know, different strata of, of the millennia if possible. Um, but yeah, so Songs of Mother Europe has been really fun. This will be our fifth season this fall. We're also planning a Celtic wisdom course, which is going to be focused on Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, not just songs, but story and craft. So sending people actual packages in the mail, like with plant material, animal material, we'll see what comes in the packages. <laughs> that mm. one I'm really excited about the Celtic wisdom course. And part of that is what does Celtic even mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of the education of that course and also yeah the song story and craft of the celtic isles and i'll be doing a pilgrimage end of september with 
Lana, an ancestral pilgrimage. So that's some of what's coming up. And in my personal life, I'm holding the prayer, even in this coming, maybe before this podcast comes out, it will have landed, but to really ground weaving remembrance in a physical location mm. where a where a roundhouse can be built. And there's mm. And we're starting the School of Ancestral Arts. So mm. that's like, like in brewing, which will be ancestral skills, song, story, yeah, an actual physical boom like mm. <laughs> location. So I'll mm. be curious the next couple of months, what brews that's yeah, that's those are the seeds I'm tending to. Amazing. Yeah. So is there, and I can put website and Instagram and whatever in the show notes. Um, remembrance.org. Remembrance.org. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. My, my personal is Hanalei.org. I'll have my, my personal song container called birthing your wild voice. I may start another one of those in the fall. I really love that getting a group of small group of women together who want to explore the, the intimate relationship with the voice. Mm -hmm. and yeah I've been teaching voice for the last three plus years and I realize I don't I don't teach voice because I think that I'm a great singer I teach voice because it's one of my favorite ways to commune with my own heart and life and to move energy and to pray Mm -hmm. and just the place that I can go in myself through Mm -hmm. my own voice that's that's what I'm passionate about so yeah love that (laughs) Yeah, we don't need to bring more like perfectionism into that. Our voices have been silenced by perfectionism enough. <laughs> you think you're not a singer? You can just drop that story right now. Yeah. Go we'll sing out in nature. Yeah. And then you're a singer. <laughs> Speak it on its so. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for this conversation oh yeah you have got another song coming through do you I want to love share your the sound yeah sound for musicians on mm-hmm. i'd love to share this gratitude for carolyn hillier who's mm. a newer beloved teacher in my life who has been tracing bringing reviving basically this four thousand year old proto-Celtic mother tongue, which is are the root words of the living Celtic languages all compiled into these, she calls it the bone words. So she has a book called Her Bone Bundle, and her bone bundle is where she compiled and categorized these old words to be used for prayer and chant. So this particular song is one of my favorites of Carolyn, and I'll do a shorter version. yeah like we're talking about language just tasting these words in my mouth Mm. and in my body I love it I do too. <laughs> that one comes through for me a lot. Mm. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you for bringing that. So on that note, then, yeah, let's all just take a few deep breaths in and out and just let the ripples of this conversation and of that last prayer, that last invocation, that last song, just kind of move through not just our mind, but our bodies, maybe even like welcoming it in through the different layers of your body. So it's like it touches your skin and then it moves in muscle to bone, to cell, to atom, to DNA. And letting yourself be sensitized again to receiving to sound. To being changed by the world, by the ripples the world sends through you and in exchange sending ripples back through the world. And so in deep gratitude, we close out our time around the fire today. Once again, thanking the land, thanking the fire, thanking all of you for being here, thanking Hanalei for being here. <laughs> and yeah, we'll see you next time around the fire. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Thank you, Hana. Part of this wild, sacred journey. Hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Hi, Kate here again. Thank you for gathering with us. Whether you've been here a while or found your way here thanks to today's guest, it means so much to me and the world I dream of to have you here. I hope you'll tune in for more of our conversations. We humans seem to be at a profound threshold and facing questions of deep impact for the future and the world. We need our full hearts and humanity as we sow seeds of change in these times of joy and heartbreak. I count myself lucky to be here now, around this virtual village fire, weaving our stories into a medicine with humans like you. As a community medicine space, this podcast is relational. It weaves webs of connection and mutual respect and care across time and space. If you appreciate and support the future we're seeding here, you can support the weaving of this web in a few ways. One, share episodes with friends and family or online with your community. It also helps the podcast immensely if you like, rate, subscribe to, or follow the podcast where you watch or listen, so you get notified when new episodes drop and new listeners find us as they search. Two, join us on Patreon. Doing so supports conversations like the one you just heard and allows you access to live community gatherings and medicine circles and more as we continue to grow. It also helps me keep this space advertisement free so the conversations stay intact as they are. If you have questions, suggestions, connections, or would like to find out more about working with me, you can find me online at www.wildsacredjourney.com, on Instagram at wildsacredjourney underscore KP, or email me, kate at wildsacredjourney.com. Until next time, from my heart to yours, I release today's fire with a prayer for our individual and collective wholeness, connection, and joy. May it be so.